Hey guys, this is the Fan of Fan Podcast. I'm Ben. And I'm Top Listen. For all you Grand Uppers out there, this podcast is for you. And we are delighted to be joined by our first ex-professional footballer since we started this podcast. It is the former Sunderland, Rochdale, Bradford City, Motherwell centre-half, Simon Ramsden. How are you, mate? Very well, lads. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Thank you. Good. Pleasure to have you on, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Nice to be on. So, so as you know, you're an ex-professional footballer, but when did you start playing football and how did you get into football? Um, from as early as I can remember, to be honest with you. Um, as soon as I could walk, I think my dad gave me a footy. And I, um, I started to see, uh, like my team, Sunderland, I started going to see them when I was four-year-old, I think it was. I used to get taken home and away to the matches. And I think my love for football came came from that and um yeah from there then onwards it was just every chance that I got I, I was it's all I wanted to do um and that that never stopped really until I obviously ended up playing professionally when I left school and was it Sunderland who you you went through the academy ranks with yeah so when I was um I mean I, I played for numerous like youth clubs and different teams when I was younger and your counties or your district teams and what have you. But it was a Sunderland scout that spotted me when I was 15. Um, and at the time, I had a season ticket for Sunderland. So it was like it was like winning the lottery, really. Um, just even going to have a trial with them or to train with them and what have you. Um, and yeah, it just went from there. Signed for them when I was 15. And then when I left school, uh, at 16, they offered me an apprenticeship. Like in them days, it was like a YTS. It's different now, obviously, with the scholarships and what have you. But um, yeah, it was um, it was just surreal, really, being a Sunderland fan and then signing for the club when I left school was um, it was unbelievable. It's every young boy's dream, isn't it, playing for the boy or club <laughs> in one way or another? Totally, and you know, like when people say, "Oh, what's your dream?" and people say, "Oh, I don't know, to play for England or to win hundred caps or do whatever." Mine was just to play for Sunderland. That was my only my only dream not necessarily I want to be a professional footballer I just wanted to play for Sunderland so to sign for them it was as if I'd already sort of fulfilled dream um when I left school so it was it was amazing um and just being around the squad at that time it was it was a good time for for the club um when you've got like your Quins and your Phillips and some some of the best days I suppose in my lifetime, uh, following Sunderland, never mind playing alongside them every day and training and stuff. So it was, yeah, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. So, so what what year was was you involved with the academy? Um, what year? What I'm trying to think. I think it was about '95 when I signed when I was at school. I think I left school in '97. So yeah, 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 I think the first year when I joined Sunderland was the year we left Roker Park and we moved to the Stadium of Light. So mm-hmm. I was a bit gutted about that because obviously as a kid going to the matches at Roker Park you always dream about playing there and if they'd have stayed there obviously I would have ended up playing there but um, we we moved to the Stadium of Light and um, yeah it, w- it was just it was just a good time for the club the, the, they finished second in the uh, seventh in the Premier League two years in a row and it was just yeah there was a lot of momentum at the time and like some unbelievable crowds and yeah it's good good memories Fantastic. In in terms of playing in front of a crowd, then mm-hmm. what's it like playing in front of a crowd, especially as well known Sunderland support is? Um, for for myself, I, I, I can only speak for me. Like some players would maybe freeze under the, <laughs> a big crowd, or when I've played in big games like at Wembley, or I played in Europe for Motherwell and things like that. Like for for me personally, the bigger the crowd, the the better for me. I I just thrive on it. I love I love the atmosphere. I love the pressure of it. Um and it's it's just something that I've always thrived on. It's something that now that I've retired that I quite miss actually. The pressure of playing in front of a big crowd. Um but I think the back end of my career when I I, I signed for Gateshead the last year and I was playing in front of like four or five hundred people and honestly if you'd have seen me play I was probably one of the worst in the team because I don't know, I just you go from playing in front of big crowds, like when I was at Motherwell, we were playing at Celtic and Rangers and European games. And I don't know, just something that I've always 
thrived on. Um, so yeah, for me, playing in front of big crowds was 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 amazing. Mm-hmm. Get gets the uh, blood flowing, gets you ready for action. It does. Well, at the end of the it's day, that's, that's, that's yeah. what you that's what you want to be a footballer for, isn't it? You know, when you when you're a kid and yeah. you watch it on the telly and you're watching, I don't know, the cup finals or whatever, and you're dreaming about playing at Wembley and. That's that's what you want. You want to play in front of the big crowds and the big stages. So, if you don't want to do that, then you're in the wrong game, as far as I'm concerned. Like so, um, yeah. No, that, like you said, for me, it was it's something that I still miss now. Running out on a Saturday and, and playing in front of big crowds. Yeah, but I bet you wouldn't be too keen on playing this day today, would you? <laughs> With the the all the behind closed doors. No, well, the VAR. Keen on that, to be honest. Um, I just, I just hmm. think it just takes the game. Um, I know, obviously, why they brought it in and and what have you. And I can, I see both sides of it. But for me, whether you look at it as a footballer or if you look at it as a fan, like you, you're celebrating a goal, then you're like, well, is it going to count? Is it not going to count? And it's, I don't know. It's just, it's just took some of the some of the excitement from the game for me. Mm-hmm. I completely agree, and. I, I hope it stays in the Premier League. I hope it doesn't make its way down the leagues because e- even like just looking at the, the decision with the Jagielka red card today, it, it stopped the mm-hmm. play. It's not it's not the referee on the pitch what's in control. It's the people at Stockley Park and they're what they're watching it on cameras. It's it's made it a completely different game, especially to when you was playing as well. It has. Um and I know it's it's mad because obviously I mean, the goal that really springs to mind for me is when Lampard scored. Was it in the World Cup? I think it was against Germany. It was about yeah. a, a foot yeah. over the line. And then I guarantee if you asked any of us, we'd all have been like, yeah, let's get VR. We need it, blah, blah, blah. So I see it, both sides of it. But for me, as a as a player, um, or even as a fan, <clears throat> it, it just does just take some of the, like, the flow of the game away or you like, you stood waiting for five minutes after a goal while they do a check, seeing what's going on, and I don't know. It's just not for me. It's each of their own, but it's not for me. Yeah. Are, you, are you glad that you didn't play in the time where VR was around them? The tackles I put in there, I would I wouldn't have got away with it. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I had enough red cards as it was without VAR getting involved. So I, I'll definitely over the moon with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good point. Yeah, especially with that. Um, that Suchek red card, it's full of me the other oh, week, eh? That was nothing, was it? That's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> I, d- I do miss, like, I suppose when I first came through, it was old school, and you had your proper old school pros who were like, right, leave a tackle on someone, let them know you're in the game, and that's that was sort of it. You would never get booked for, like, a high tackle after five minutes. It was sort of like putting your marker down and you'd get a warning or whatever. Whereas now, like you say, that Suchek or, or anybody nowadays, like, you tap someone and you get a yellow card. Or a little tug on the shirt, or whatever. Like you cannot get away with anything now. Um, and the whole physical side of the game's just t- completely changed in the last ten years. Yeah, absolutely right, mate. I mean, gone are the days where defenders would come off the pitch absolutely soaked in mud. Totally. But soaked in mud, where they've got a <laughs> bit of blood on. Even if you like cut your lip, you've got to come off the pitch now, haven't you? Or whatever. It's just I don't yeah. Know. yeah. It's not the same game that I used to play anyway. No, oh, for sure. In in terms of your mm-hmm. career, then, am I right in saying you were a defender? Yeah, well, it's one of them. I would say the majority of my career right back. I wouldn't say that best position. I would say centre half is probably my best position. But I'm six foot one, and I was always like, I could hold me on. I was decent in the air, but. You know, it's like you come up against a big six foot four strike or whatever. I was maybe just that tiny bit short to be an out and out centre half. Um, so a lot of the time I did play right back. Um, but on occasions I played midfield as well. So I, I quite enjoy playing centre midfield. It's one of them. I'm, I'm the type of lad like if the gaffer said we're playing your left wing or centre forward or whatever, I would just go on with it and just think, right, not a problem. So as much as I played in defence, it wouldn't have bothered me wherever I played. I, I just loved just being out there. And in terms of your career, then do you have any sort of highlights or any moments of your career what stands out? It's probably three, I would say, as the main highlights. Um, 
making my debut for Sunderland. Uh, it was only a short uh, period, but I suppose making your debut for your boy has got to be number one. Um, so I would say that. Uh, playing at Wembley, we got beat in a playoff final, but just my whole family coming down, friends, just to say you've played at the National Stadium and in a big occasion, like the final was was amazing, even though we got beat, like I say. Um, and the, I was making, I actually signed for Motherwell and my debut was in the Champions League for them. So, yeah, wow. so I'd, I'd left Bradford, who were playing in League Two, um, and Motherwell just qualified for the Champions League. So my debut was against Panathinaikos. So that was um, that Oof. was something else, really, playing at home to them and then going out away at Panathinaikos. So yeah, I would say them them three are probably the the highlights that stand out in in my head. It's a massive step up that league league two to the Champions. I know, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, what, it's even like playing in that is a massive step up but for it to be your first game so you're just like obviously settling in at the club and you've never actually played on the home pitch or what have you well apart from like a pre-season the Champions League it was it was surreal but um, no it was amazing great memories it must make the hairs on your arms and legs stand oh, up totally. here in the roar of the crowd. Yeah, like I can, yeah. I can still remember the build-up to the game and the atmosphere, and yeah, it was, it was unbelievable to be honest. Um, I mean, we didn't end up winning, and Panathinaikos went through, but I suppose that was to be expected. The size of the clubs, um, but yeah, and then mm-hmm. we had some other European ties when I was at Motherwell, and yeah, just good experiences. Yeah. So did you did you play in the Europa yeah, League as well? Yeah, played. Was that well? Um, yeah. I think we played um, in Russia. We played Krasnodar. That was a good experience. We played in Iceland mm-hmm. against Jarnan. Levante as well, but I was injured for that game, so I didn't play out in Levante. But um, yeah, yeah, it was good. Like I say, playing out in Russia and Iceland and um, good experiences. <clears throat> what? Well- What's what is it like playing Champions League football? Then what what hypes you up for that? Um, game? It, it's one of them. Obviously, we didn't make the group stages or what have you. So it it we were like massive, massive underdogs. So for me, it was just going out and just basically with it being this, my first game for the club, just going out and showing everybody that I could handle playing at that level. No one really knew me when I just signed for Motherwell, and then I was thrown in straight away playing the Champions League. So it was more about, yeah, enjoy the occasion. Uh, amazing walking out to the the anthem or what have you. Um, but it was just more personally just, right, have a good game, try and keep a clean sheet, do your job sort of thing. Um, and then look look back on it afterwards. But um, no, like I said, I had a decent-ish game. We got beat 2-0, held me on. And um, yeah, it, it's one of them just... It's surreal, I suppose, a little bit when you look back because a lot of my career I played in League Two. So there's not many people, I suppose, who've been in League Two ended up playing in the Champions League. So it's quite a nice touch, I think. Yeah, yeah it might be a very small elite club. Yeah, there, I mate. don't think yeah. there's many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, maybe some towards the end of their careers, if you know what I mean. Like, you know, 38, I still want to play in the lower leagues, but. Uh... To, to take the step up after League Two, I think definitely you'd be in a very small club. Yeah, there. I, 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 was, I yeah. suppose I'm fortunate in a little way because Stuart McCall, who was the Motherwell manager, signed me for Bradford before that. So he, he had mm-hmm. me at the club, uh, he left, and there was a few managers after him. But it was it was from that that obviously he was looking for a centre-half and I, I was a free in the summer and it came about from there. So I signed, signed with him again. Um, which which was great because like I would like to think that Stuart was probably the best. Well, there's no probably he was the best manager I played under, so it was it was nice to link up with him again as well as playing in the Champions League. Yeah, I was just about to ask that question. Who was the best you worked for? Because uh, <laughs> remember you touched on it on the episode yeah. under the cosh that Stuart McCall. I remember seeing that the other day. Um, but what what made Stuart stand out? To other managers um, that you work for, it's like I've I've played under some good managers, played up under a couple of bad ones, um, and all of them have got, you know, what I mean, different positives and negatives. But for Stewart, 
Um, for me, he just got me, and I just got him. And he was—he's just like a, a loyal person. If you're producing the goods for him, um, you're putting in a hundred percent. He'll back you all day. Um, I've played for managers in the past who I don't know. You might have a class game on a Saturday, and you're the best thing since sliced bread. But things might not go to pan, and you might have lost the goal for the team on a Tuesday night, and all of a sudden. You're useless, and you're on the bench on the Saturday. Where Stuart wasn't like that. He was he was loyal, and um, he just knew that I would always give a hundred percent for him. And I think he appreciated that, and um, I appreciated that he put faith in me, signing me twice for Bradford and for Motherwell. So we, uh, yeah, we just we just clicked. To be honest, do you, do you reckon you could have been the Paddy Kenny and the Neil Warnock um, saga if? <laughs> if you stayed in football a bit longer, oh, I don't know about that, mate. He's. Do you know what it is though? Like people like Neil Warnock and what have you. Um, they're just the the very rare, aren't they? Now, like just characters in the game, old school. He's probably not really changed how how he goes about things that much in the last twenty thirty years. But he gets results, and everywhere he goes, he gets players on board. And I think Stewart's a little bit similar to that. Stewart was Neil Warnock's assistant. He's played under him. And he just gets how people work. Like, I've had managers who, they treat you a little bit like a kid or sort of like, I don't know, it's just like going back to school or whatever, the way they speak to you, where Stuart speaks to you like a man. End of the day, like, I was 30-odd-year-old then, you've got lads in the team who's played four, five, six hundred games, and he treats you with respect. And I think that's why people would, would look to run through a brick wall for him, because they love him for that. Whereas some other managers, they think... I don't know. They've got every qualification under the sun, and they can just like speak down to you. And I don't think that works with 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 footballers, or or any walk of life, really. To be honest, yeah. Is, I any, agree there. Yeah, is there any particular manager who, who you're referring to there? Speak to you like kids. Um, I think they've all had spells. I mean, Steve Parkin when I was at Rochdale was was a bit it was a little bit like that. Um, I mean, at first he was right with me, but. Yeah, it was just it's just a lack of respect. I think it's like, like I was saying before, if you have a good game, you class. If you if you have an off day, all of a sudden you're rubbish. And um, I don't know. It's it's not how I would I would do it if I was a manager. You've got you've got to know your players. You've got to know. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm not pulling my weight, and um, I don't know, I'm at the back of the running and training, or I'm late, or crap on a Saturday, <clears throat> go for it. Like you, you deserve it. And if I was a manager, I would give out Rollicans as well for anybody like that. But if you've got lads in the team who you know will give you hundred percent and run through a brick wall for you and they have an off date, you've got to put your faith in them type of type of people because they're the ones that would that'll sort of get the rest of the team going. And that's who people look up to. The ones who always give a hundred percent. So I think that was a little bit of my bugbear in my career when managers could see that I would, I would literally give anything for the team, but then they put you on the bench or they bomb you out or just like I say, I, I can't cope with people who treat you with a, a lack of respect. Well, it's certainly not a way to get the best out of out of your players if you treat them that way. Totally. I mean, you just—it's like any job, though, isn't it? Like, it's not just football. Know, know who, know who you're working with and how they tick. Now, some lads need an arm around the shoulder. Some lads need to be shouted at to get going. You just, that's, I suppose that's what the best man manages. That's why they are where they are. They know how to get the best out of players. And if you're not producing the goods and, you, and you're not doing it, then move them on. And if I was ever in that boat where I down tools and I got moved on, you can't have any questions of that. You just got to accept it. Um, but yeah, th- for me, You've just got to put your faith in your players and and treat them like like grown men. That's that's if I ever went into coaching, that's how I would treat them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on the. Uh, some people need to be shouted at. Some people, I, I personally, me, I'm, I'm probably the ones that need to be shouted at. That that, that yeah. gets me into gear. But I don't know any success stories where the gaffers spoke to a player like a five year old. I've never heard that success story before. No. Unless Brian Clough no, did that, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, like, I don't know. It's there's the saying you've got to be cruel to be kind at times, and I get that. And like you say, you 
you personally, you, you might work better off someone shouting at you. I, I was probably the other way. I can deal with people shouting at me. And if I've done wrong, I can take it. I'm like, that's not a problem to me. But when I'm doing well, if someone says, tells me that, so I don't know, Ramos, you're doing unreal today. It'd make me feel 10 foot tall and want to do even better. And it's just knowing your players and how they tick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you've come off the pitch as man of the match and Gaffer says, well done, but you should have done a bit better on that header there what you missed from getting that chance and it's pretty frustrating. Yeah, isn't it? exactly. Definitely. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they feel the need to sort of bring people down at times. Like, the more confidence that you've got or the more confidence that's going throughout your squad, the better chance you've got of winning on a Saturday. So, for me, if someone's doing the business, build them up as much as you can. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, um, after Sunderland, was it was it Notts County um, assigned for? When I was at Sunderland, I went on loan to Notts County for a season. Um, yeah. But then I came back to Sunderland. I had another year on my contract. Um, so that was yeah. that was just in League One, which was a good experience because that's my first opportunity to play league football, really. So now it was it was good to get out, and I think I played thirty odd games that season in League One, which was. As a young lad, I think I was like twenty year old. It was, it was, um, it was good. Yeah. What, 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 what? Who did you, who did you play under at North um, County? And what, what? Who were the teammates as well? Like, yeah, I think of the yeah, team. Yeah, uh, Billy Dayden was the manager. He was quite old school. He must have been late sixties or even yeah. in his seventies, I think. Um, the manager, but he, he was all right. Um, but in the squad. Had like um, Darren Caskey, who used to play for Tottenham. He, he was he was a great lad, good player. Um, they, they had no really like star names that anybody really, unless you're a Notts County fan, would probably have heard of. But for that league, we had some good players: Nick Fenton, um, like I say Caskey, Danny Olsop up front, Neil Stallard. Um, we had some good pros: Tony Hackworth, and um, yeah, I think. We were, I think we ended up finishing like bottom half of the table, but we um, now we held our own. We had some good wins that season, and it was a, it was a good experience for me. Yeah. Who was the toughest player you come up against? Um, would you say for me? I don't mind the physical battle. So if I was thinking of the best player I've came up against, it wouldn't be someone that's like out fought me or won a header at the back post or whatever. It's I wasn't the quickest. <clears throat> I could hold me on, and I'm not slow. But if I had someone who was absolutely rapid up against me, I'd always struggle, and I'd need to get very tight to them and try and like lay a marker down, which is like what we spoke about before. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't know. I mean, like in Scotland, you come up against some class players, like your Celtics and your Rangers, your Aberdeens, and all that. But when I was in, like, I don't know, League Two, I remember Omar Daly, and he ended up actually signing um, for Motherwell as well when I was up there. Well, he was there before me, but he was at Motherwell. And, yeah, I remember playing against him for Rochdale against Bradford, and he was just on another level. They just kept putting the ball over my head, and he was just that fast. It was like you saying, Bolt. It was just like, there's nothing you can do against Pace. It's like you watch it now in the Premier League, like your Sterlings or that Traore for Wolves or whatever, once they put the ball past you, I don't care how good of a defender you are, you're not catching them. So, well, that's it. It, it, it does. Spring, and it? Like we spoke about before, when they took that um, sort of that side of the game out where you can't really lay, lay a tackle on someone, um, then what do you do? So like before, say in the early years of my career, I'd, if I'm thinking, right, he's he's rapid here, I'll just think, right, I'll just lay a heavy tackle on him and he might not want to know from then onwards. Whereas towards the back end of my career, like I say, you even just tug someone's shirt or you blow them, they'll probably fall over and you'll get a booking like. So you had to sort of uh, change your game a little bit and just try and get as tight as possible to them because if you give them any space and they put the ball past you, it's game over, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, especially these days. Well, what one? But they're all athletes nowadays, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like when I when I was younger, everyone was pretty similar. You'd go out on a drink on a Tuesday after training or something, or on a weekend, and you weren't strict on your diet. No one had six packs really in the first team, or it was it was just like just normal lads, really. 
and then like now, yes. I can't imagine anybody in the country goes out on the drink after training on a Tuesday now in the Premier League or anywhere. Or they're all absolute animals, like probably do 100 metres in 10 seconds. They all got six packs. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's like a different game now. They're all athletes. Yeah, absolutely, mate. They're a lot stricter. I mean, mine just get upset at one bad day on the diet. Totally. Days, Everything's they? tracked, monitored. They'll all, they'll all have the dietitians yeah. at the club, body fat monitors, everything, which I'm all for that. Like I say, I, I keep myself in, in good nick now and I'm not complaining about that side of it, but I'm just thinking like back to when I first started and some of the lads used to come up against to, like you say, they, they did have a bit of a belly on them or they're just like yeah. old school lads go out on a Saturday night. They, they're few and far between in the game now, if any, to be honest. Yeah, they're, they're a dying breed in the mm. professional game, sadly. But they are some good characters. And one, one I'm sure we'll all agree on, who was known for being that, John Parkin. Oh, d- definitely. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> what like a guy. Say, he's, he's a definite one-off. I remember playing against him when he was at Macclesfield and I was at Grimsby. But, um, yeah, like I think if you're, an, if you're a, a target man, you can maybe get away with being a bit heavier, maybe at the back of the running and whatever, as long as you're banging the goals in and... You're helping the team on a Saturday, but I think that's probably the only position on the pitch yeah. that you could get away with that. If you maybe centre half to an extent, um, but apart from that, you, nowadays you you would not be able to get away with uh, being a little bit out of shape or, or like you say, going out Saturday nights, Tuesday nights, whatever, like like we did in our day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and the target man that's really big I can think of that's still playing in the game these days is uh, Akin Fenwa. Yeah, but I can't imagine, like I say, I'd imagine he keeps himself in good shape. I've, I've, I've seen him training and stuff and what have you. He doesn't look like the type who eats rubbish and, and boozes all the time. Do you know what I mean? He's he's late 30s and yeah. still playing at a, <laughs> yeah. a very decent level, so fair play to him. Um, but yeah, the only, I'm trying to think, like you say, the, they are a dying breed now, the old school target man. Another one I can think of, um, centre half. Uh, if you've met him, yeah. Steve McNulty played for York last season. Yeah, he's yeah, always been a big lad, hasn't he? Uh, but but got away with it because he's technically yeah. very, very good. There was a lad at um, Rochdale and me, uh, Crooksy. He used to play for Man City, and he he was a bit heavier, but he was technically unbelievable with both feet. And if if you are a little bit um, bigger or your diet's not spot on, you need to be very good at other aspects of your game to get away with it. And um, Obviously, that McNulty's he is, and a few others have been as well in the past. Yeah, yeah for sure. And who can forget uh, the goalkeeper who ate the pie for what was it? Oh, Wayne yeah. Shaw, his name. Remember him as well? Yeah. <laughs> but for for a goalie, I couldn't imagine it being good. But he got so much praise over his career. I know. I don't, I don't really know too much about him, to be honest. I do remember the story and what have you, and that with the pie and things, but I don't. I don't really know that much about him. Yes. I, I, I remember him um, facing a little segment on the uh, Gillette Soccer Special once. I saw it was on YouTube, and uh, he got a lot of praise from right. fans for being a good goalie. Being All man right, of the no, good. quite a lot. No, I'd, like I say, I, do, I don't really know <laughs> yeah. that much about him, but uh, I do. I do remember, like you say, the stories yeah. and it being in the paper and that. Yeah. yeah. As a defender, obviously, uh, and a right back, I'm, I'm guessing you've not scored too many goals. Goals, but what would you say your best goal? Um, well, like you say, I don't, I don't score many, many goals. I think I only got like seven, maybe seven or eight in my whole career. Um, but I signed, I left Grimsby and signed for Rochdale, and it was either the week after or two weeks after we played them, and I scored an overhead kick. Now, what I was doing up there in the first place or scoring over a kicks, I don't know. But anyway, I did. And then we played Grimsby again uh, at Blundell Park and I scored two. I scored a volley with my left foot, which my left foot's just for standing on normally, um, and and scored, like I say, a goal in the second half as well. So they're the ones that stand uh, <clears throat> in my mind. I remember scoring a volley from Motherwell away at Dundee United. That was... It was like a consolation goal, though, to be honest. But now, apart from that, I would say the goals against Grimsby, the overhead kick or the volley at Blundell Park, probably the two. 
what what's it like scoring that overhead kick? And just seeing the fans going absolutely yeah, mental. it was a bit surreal. It was more surreal, like thinking, "Is that just gone in?" Because, like I say, I'm not used to scoring. I played up front when I was a kid and what have you, and you're scoring like ten for your school team or whatever. Like, but it's totally different, isn't it? There's no crowds there or anything. But when, um, <clears throat> yeah, when it went in, it was a bit surreal, especially the one at Grimsby, because um, it was like I say, it was it was at the the main home end, um, and I volleyed it with my left foot, so. Yeah, it was one of them. You, like I can't even remember how I celebrated. Probably just in shock. <laughs> <laughs> probably my manager's probably in shock as well. Thinking what's he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you, you're probably not going to be a big fan of this one because Alan Shearer. But <laughs> his celebration was just either one arm or two arm in air every time he scored. It's... <laughs> You don't really get that now from players. They've always got these... Yeah, they've situations. all got these stupid dancers and all sorts now, haven't they, and what have you. But, um, yeah, the less said about Shearer, the better, mate. We'll leave, we'll leave it on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Although we could talk about his penalty miss against Sunderland when we won 2-1, if you want. That's a, that's a good one, like. But, but um, Yeah, if but you nah, want to talk about it, we I was. Were um, you at that game? Yeah, we won 2-1. Now Quinn scored with a header, and then they got a penalty, and you're thinking, oh, here we go. And um, yeah, Thomas Sorensen served it, so that was that was great. What was your we, oh, I don't know. I probably went about three days. rows down there, just di- diving about somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to ask, were you in the away end? Or yeah, was I was. Like I was yeah, playing yeah. for the club at the time. I was just in the youth setup, but there was four yeah. or five of us. I remember went through to that match. Um, also, like some lads in the youth team who followed us and. Uh, yeah, just good memories because at that time Newcastle had a really good squad. It was when they were in Europe and what have you, and we probably weren't expected to even get a draw, never mind a win. So yeah, they were always the best ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many how many time and where derby? I honestly you don't think I've missed one since. I don't know. It's funny. It was like a running joke at every club I played at. Like if someone played Newcastle, like oh, he's either going to get sent off. He's either going to be ill or someone's died or something so he can go. Um, but uh, nah, as it happens, because they were generally in the Premier League a lot of the time, um, it was always moved to like a Sunday 12 o'clock kickoff. So nearly every game, I didn't really have to do anything to, to go to with. If you know what I mean? We'd play on a Saturday, then I'd come home and go to the match. Um, <clears throat> there might be the odd. Yeah. But booking and illness or so, and the odd one like that. I can't, but I can't really think off the top of my head. But yeah, I've I don't think I've missed one since the nineties, mate. Off the, that I can think of. Wow. Now, I'm, am I right in saying you're still unbeaten yeah. since twenty twelve? Six wins in a row, and then we drew the last one. I think that's oh. right. And yeah. I was it all sick. Well, all seven. Yeah. yeah. The what? But I was it. Oh. Uh-huh. So I remember the one. The one that sticks out the most to me is the uh, Paolo Di Canio Scottish game, the, the three nil. I watched it thinking, "Wow, what what on earth has happened to Do Sunderland you know now?" The morning of that football. game, I remember being in the pubs. Like the pubs open early when it's Derby Day. We're in the pubs at like seven in the morning or something, and not one person was confident. It was like we've been playing shocking. Um, and yeah. like I say, you you we went through on the Met Raw. Um, and you just like it's like anything you go on like the atmosphere was un- incredible but you go on more in hope than anything thinking like let's just try and get anything out of this game and to perform like that win 3-0 that was the that was probably the best one out of the recent run of like like I say since 2012 because it was the it was the one where everyone was more shocked I think after that we just had like we had one over them. They just couldn't beat us. It was just like it wasn't expected, but you know what I mean. Like we thought, well, we'll do them again. Whereas on that one, yeah, I think everyone was just completely in shock. Would you have? Would you have wanted to play uh, within one of these games? I and no, like it'd be good to look back on now and say, oh, when I played against the Mags, but. I don't know if I would have been able to keep my head, to be honest with you. Like, the old build-up and the atmosphere and, like, literally, you would just do anything to win that game. So, it's it's whether I could have contained myself on the pitch and stuff, I don't know. 
It's it's hard to say because I'll never know now. But it, it, I suppose in hindsight, it would have been amazing to have played in one of them. What would you What would you have done if you'd have uh, scored in one of them? God, I don't know. Maybe got locked up or something. I don't know. I'd have, I... <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I, oh Jesus! I don't, I, I don't, can't put that into words, mate. I don't know. You've, you've got me stuck there. I don't know what I would do. I maybe okay, I'll picture the scenario for you. The Newcastle end or something like that, like, and then get locked up and the game will get abandoned or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll picture the scenario for you. It's uh, it's nil nil. It's the ninety ninety mm. seventh minute. At the stadium of light, you've got a corner in the last last kick of the game. This is you go up for it. Corner's whipped in. It's your head. It's in. I think I'll just strip off and just go, just do a full lap, mate. (laughs) (laughs) There'll be a pitch invasion for a start, so I'd maybe get away with that. They might not notice. uh, (laughs) Yeah, I think I would have just completely lost the plot if that had happened there. I probably would have re- retired. Not for the, uh, the I've next out of bio celebration. Well, on that note, I don't think you've ever beaten that, are you? <laughs> That's the pinnacle. Right? No, no. Well, to be fair, you, sco- you said you scored at it, Stadium LA. It like, probably would have been 10 times better oh, if you got the winner at Stadium That Saint would have been James the one, Park. wouldn't it? Just to silence them. Either, to be honest. Like, imagine yeah. the scenes at, the, at um, the stadium, though, like 40 odd thousand celebrating with you. That would have been unbelievable. But. It, yeah. Oh, I, I'd be I'd definitely would it? Both would have been nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's it's like mm. Billy, Billy Sharp. He's played in a few Steel City derbies. I don't think he scored against Sheffield Wednesday mm-hmm. whilst playing for United. But he, he was there when we won 4 2 at Hillsborough. And you oh, can just totally. imagine the scene. No, that's what it's like. But as a fan, that's what you want in your team. It's like when I was coming through and you've got your Michael Grays and local <laughs> lads, Martin Smiths and people like that, Sunderland fans in the, in the team. So when, when it's Derby Day, you know they know what it, what it means. And like your Billy Sharps and what have you, I think it's great when you see local lads in your team because you know they're like you. They, they want to win as badly as you do. Yeah. No, I totally agree with the likes of uh, Curtis Jones and Trent Alexander Arnold yeah. and Liverpool's team, local lads. It is. Yeah. Club, I think it's fantastic. Great Grealish at Villa. Yeah. Also, they yeah. know what it means. I mean, I think Leeds, Liam Cooper yeah. at Leeds, I think he's yeah, that's what you want, team. isn't it? Yep. Yeah, definitely. They know what it means. There's not enough of that now, unfortunately, with a lot of the, the foreign players that's come into the game. A lot of them maybe don't understand the importance of a derby day or what it means to the fans like like they used to. That's a shame. That's that, that definitely true. So, oh, I forgot where it is. You, you, you said you've played in in Europe and you've you've played in, in Scotland and Leeds. So what would you say the best, best ground? ground um, probably. Well, Wembley was was amazing in the playoff final. The new Wembley. I'd love to play it at the old Wembley been there a few times obviously you watch Sunderland and stuff but uh, the new Wembley was great Panathinaikos was a great experience playing um, Ibrox Celtic both class grounds um, playing in Russia was good there's been some like you said there's been some really good stadiums but I think Wembley's probably got to be the one that I would go for to be honest that's it's like the iconic one, isn't it? But not everyone can say they played at Wembley, so I'll probably take that. Did you ever play at um, Hamden Park? No, I've been to Hamden. I went up a couple of seasons ago to watch Motherwell when they got in the cup final, but we didn't actually play at Hamden in my time up there, unfortunately. No. Oh, interesting. Um, so you yeah. played a few games in Europe. What's the, what's the atmosphere like compared um, to back on our show? Yeah, it was... It was really hostile in Panathinaikos. I remember we got like a police escort to the ground and like fireworks going off and we had to be kept in after the game and stuff like that. So that was, I think there was only like 40 odd thousand there. Like the, the stadium probably holds double that, but the atmosphere and like you say, it was, it was very hostile. Um, when we played in Russia, that was an experience. It was like going back in time. It was, 
there was about thirty odd thousand there, and it was packed. It was yeah, that was that was good. But the Iceland one that I played in, they were I think their ground only held like five thousand or so. So it wasn't like um, it wasn't too bad to be honest with you. It wasn't like the other two. But yeah, I would say Panther Night Goss was was one of the more hostile grounds I've played at. Do, do you have any sort of pre? Did you have any sort of pre-match routine? Not really. I wasn't like massively superstitious. Um, if I had a good game and what have you, I'd keep the same boots and things like that. Um, but no, I wasn't one of these of put your right sock on first or your shinies or whatever. No, I would just. I knew my routine, as in what I'd be eating before match and certain times and what I'd do the night before and things like that. But I suppose every footy lad in the country would do similar to that. Um, as a preparation for a match, but nah, I, like I say, I wasn't, I wasn't majorly superstitious. No. In in terms of sort of after a season, then, like if I look back at Sheffield United, there's been uh, times where when we got promoted, mm-hmm. all the team went to Vegas, and there was. There was one where I believe they went to Dublin in fancy dress. Oh, was there any of that when you were playing? Every year, because like you said, you usually go to football. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pretty is pretty much every season. I think out of the all the clubs I was at, um, I'll say Rochdale was probably the, the squad that went together the most. Like, well, I would say it was my happiest out of my whole career, like as in a group of lads. But we never actually went abroad together as a full squad. We went to Dublin on a Christmas do and things like that. But Rochdale, the full team went. There must have been like twenty of us, and the assistant manager and everyone, and the atmosphere and the team spirit was was unreal. Um, so we used to, yeah, we used to go to Magaluf every summer, and then um, Bradford. We never really did it. It was more, it was more me still going away with lads I'd played with beforehand than the actual squad. Um, and Motherwell, like I say, amazing lads, but we didn't actually all all go away at the end of the season, unfortunately. Do you have any uh, funny oh, memories? Of half these of them trips? blur, mate. To be honest, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you've got me on the spot there. No, just just the usual, mate. It's just it, it's one of them. I think everyone through the season, it's it's what you look forward to. You work hard, you train hard every day, and you just look forward to a blowout. So you just go off the rails for like four or five days, and then you think, right, I'm never drinking ever again. When you get back, we all know that 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 never lasts. Um, and uh, no, nah, like I said, there's not there's not one story majorly off the top of my head what I can think of, but um, well, well, a few of me like Vegas trips and that. Some of them were, were crazy, but it wasn't necessarily with all like the footy lads. Um, like when I got me tattoo and things mm-hmm. like that, it was just like I said, they're, they they're funny stories and good to look back on, but it wasn't necessarily just with the football lads. Who was the footballers you kept um, in touch with? Them when so when you, I got married, there's like there's a lad who came through with me at Sunderland, Dean Shields, and he he ended up playing a lot of his career in Scotland and played in Malta, and we speak every day. Still, we like I say he's he's one of my best mates, um, and a lad, uh, Rochdale, Tom Kennedy. He ended up having a great career. Went to Leicester, played for Barnsley, played for a few clubs, and we still speak all the time. So there's like it's one of them. It's like anything. Like I could go like five years and not see some of the lads I play with, but when you see them, it's as if you've seen them yesterday. And nothing changes. You you'll always have that connection, and um, I think that's just like life with your mates at home. Never mind football. But I would say them two are the ones that I keep in touch with the most, and especially Dean. I speak to him like say every day. Oh, I, can't I, can't I just want to. I just want to, over go, I just want to go back to the matches. <laughs> I want to. Have a night out, book a holiday, just just a bit of normality, mate. I think that's all everyone wants, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it 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 come up today on the timeline, and it it's been a year since Sheffield United's mm. last away game where fans where fans was allowed in. So it's slowly coming up to a year since we was last at a game as well, and it's been it's been absolutely 
incredible to see football still continuing. You know but it's been horrible. You know what's to even watch worse? It. Sunderland's Especially at Wembley in two weeks, and we can't even go. Like, yep. Yeah. But uh, one thing right. I was going to mention to you there, mate. Do you well, want to go? Because I know Sunderland's not got a good record either, at I've Wembley. Been <laughs> six times to watch Sunderland, and we've been beat in all six. I, me, Mrs. Family's from Grimsby. Yeah, I went to watch Grimsby play there. They got beat. And I played there for Rochdale and I got beat. So I'm, I'm definitely not the good luck charm, but just the weekend down there and Trafalgar and everything, mate, you cannot beat it, can you? So, yeah. And to be honest, we'll never yeah. ever have a better chance of winning a cup than, than in two weeks' time against, like you say, Trammy who are in the league below us. So I know they're in form, but you'd like to think this is the best chance since God knows when of winning at Wembley and none of us can go. It's sickening. Yeah, definitely the best chance. But yeah, whatever. If, if you're playing Barcelona, you know you're not going to oh, the best totally. chance. Oh, totally. You want to be there. It's like when it's I went down day when we played Man yeah. City, I think it was about seven years ago. You know you're up against it, but it's just like going to Wembley to support your team, isn't it? Um, I was in... I was there in 1992. Yeah, the day out was As a kid, we got beat off Liverpool 2 0, but it's great experiences to look back on. Thinking, oh, when I went there with my dad to Wembley, and um, yeah, like I say, in two weeks' time or whenever it is, it would have been another one of them win, lose, or draw. So I remember that time when we went to Wembley and took over Trafalgar Square again and whatever. It's, but it's just unfortunate how it's, how it's panned out. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing the whole. Uh... <clears throat> pre-match drinks on the Sunderland till I die both times and yeah it's lovely oh, to see having, everyone's having a great time it was amazing it was like real togetherness just took over London for the whole weekend mate even after we got beat you'd have thought yeah, we'd, we'd have won Ram- like, in the pubs on the night and but that's the thing like in my lifetime we've never won anything so the fan base and um, the passion up here we just we just give anything for Sunderland just to win anything um, and like I say, that's it. even if we do win in two weeks, yeah, it's going to be amazing. And it's like, yeah, we won at Wembley, but it just takes a little bit away from it that you cannot be there or even go to the pubs and celebrate with people or whatever. No, you're right. I, I completely agree. United's got Chelsea in the mm. quarterfinals of the FA Cup in a few weeks. And if we win, the, the semi finals will be played at Wembley. And I, and I believe that, again, that will, will be without anyone behind fans. I believe the final could have fans, but the semi-final, but even, yeah. there isn't. So again, but even the final, even if you have them. like 10,000 there or something, it's, like, it's not the same, is it? No, it's not. But going back to Sunderland at Wembley, am I, am I right in saying yeah. that? Yeah, it is. Is it the Papa John's trophy it's called now? Now... So is it the twenty nineteen twenty twenty final? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the that's right. So Portsmouth are playing final. like last last season's final on the Saturday, and we're playing Tranmere on the Sunday for the seasons. Yeah. So basically, we're so twenty four hours. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hey, I... enjoy it, lads. Right, we'll give it back tomorrow. So yeah, we're not breaking. <laughs> <laughs> So, so um, were you there for the uh, yeah, the Charlton game? The only one I've missed I, oh, was man. 1985. My dad had a, a back operation. I was only four, but he would have took me, guarantee it. Um, so I, I missed that. I was born in 81, so I missed the 85 one. But apart from that, I've been to every one. I was there in 1990. We got beat off Swindon in the playoffs. 92, we got beat off Liverpool in the FA Cup final. Uh, Charlton in the playoffs. Man City, League Cup final. And then... The two last season, playoffs and Johnson's pains. So I every chance I've got, I've been there, but just kind of go to this one, unfortunately. Unless I, I don't know, I might get a steward's job or something the next week. Maybe he's a, <laughs> so he's ways round it. In, I'll have to think about something. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to think of something. Become an ambassador. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, your rec- your record with Wembley. Are you sure you're not being? Uh, do you know what it is? It's the red and white stripes, mate. <laughs> just not lucky, are we? I was just about to yeah. say that. No, I think it must be. I don't think Southampton have a good record there either. 
Saying that the black and white's gone, I've much looked by the lads, so that's all right. So on the... <laughs> <laughs> Too true. In in terms of being a footballer, then, w- would you prefer to like be a footballer in this day and age with the social with the social media aspect of it? So it's like when when you were when you was playing, there, there wasn't like the likes of Twitter and Facebook and fans being able to nah, play. Definitely off. not. W- would you want to play in this like, day and age with all that? When I was playing, there was for the per- first part of it, there was no camera phones or you weren't getting any abuse. No one really knew you on a night out, or if they did. Like you say, might have a little argument and that's it. It's done and dusted. Whereas now they're all hiding keyboard warriors, aren't they? And hiding behind the screen or whatever. And to be honest, I've never had social media, even the back end of my career at all. No Facebook, no Instagram now. It was more since I've retired where through my work, I ended up going on Instagram and then I've got one for me personal one now and stuff like that. But um, nah, I definitely preferred playing it 100%. Well, this is the thing as well now, and it's that you've got the racial abuse, you've got the personal abuse, and like you said, it's just it's just football fans what hide behind a picture of a football player, and it's not not something I can I can guess a lot of players. It's not, and also you, you just say the little thing like I don't know, someone could abuse you, you comment something back, you could get a ban from the FA. Or I don't know. You like someone's tweet, all of a sudden it'll be front page if you're a Premier League player, and it's like, oh, he's like that. Or do you know what I mean? It's like, you've got to be so careful nowadays. It's happened got plenty of times. So you got it's to be, happened plenty of times. Got to be so careful. I don't know if I would be on social media if I was like playing in the Premier League or high profile at the minute. To be honest. <clears throat> yes. I, I saw it the other, the other day. Uh, mm. Roberto Firmino was like in a Richarlison mm. pose. I think it was even the goal celebration. Now, it's bad for a Liverpool fan for but actually, they're both Brazilian. They're both friends. See, that's the thing from Brazil. what people don't get. So, I don't know. Say I signed for Bradford no. and one of my ex-teammates was playing for Huddersfield, yeah. for instance, and he scored. Well, I'm over the moon for him. Do you know what I mean? He's one of my best mates. I used to play with him. But because I'm not a Bradford fan, I don't hate Huddersfield. When I, if I played against Huddersfield for Bradford, I would give everything I've got to beat them. But I don't hate Huddersfield because I'm not from there, and that's what like people don't get with Firmino and Richarlison or whatever. Yeah, he plays for Liverpool, he plays for Everton, but they can still be friends. Do you know what I mean? Different. Like for me, if I yeah. play for Sunderland, I would never ever like anything to do with the Mags because I hate them. But other people who play for Sunderland. They play for them, but they don't hate Newcastle. Do you know what I mean? They beat, we want to beat them when they play them, but they don't hate them because they're not brought up to hate them. That's true, yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. In, in, in terms of being uh, uh, with, when you were um, playing, then, did you ever swap nah, In League Two, you had to pay for your own shirts, mate. So if you swapped it, you'd be like, right, you're the kit man 40 quid or something. <laughs> Um, that's how bad it was, honestly. You got like three shirt days, and I think it was. <laughs> um, but now, when I, when I played in the I'm trying to think, it was the Russian game, swap shirts with one of the Russian players, um, in, in uh, in the Europa League. But apart from that, I can't remember really swapping any now. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm not I mean, if you're coming up against, I don't know, say if I was coming up against one of my idols to play for Sunderland or something like that, you'd take paying for another shirt, wouldn't you, and swap it. But generally, when you're playing against random League Two players who yeah. you're not that bothered about swapping it with, nah, I wasn't, I wasn't that bothered, mate. Um, no, who was your... Who was I don't your know if you will have heard team. of him, but Marco Gabbiadini was my idol as a kid. I've got him tattooed on my arm, actually. He's gone against Newcastle. Yeah, so when I was a kid, he was like... I've heard that name before, yeah. Like, yeah. He, was, he was just the goal machine for Sunderland. So, um, every, I suppose every kid in my era looked up to Gabbiadini. So he he was probably my first idol. Um, and then after him, probably like your Quinns and Phillips. Um, 
I named my youngest daughter after Niall Quinn. So, which sounds a bit random seeing as he's a boy and she's a girl. But uh, shit, I, w- I thought the third time lucky I'm going to get a lad. <laughs> so I was always going to get Marco <laughs> after Gabbiadini. And then um, we'd done one of them gender reveals and it was uh, another lass, wasn't it? So I was thinking, I had to get me thinking cap on. So I ended up calling Nell Quinn. <laughs> so she's uh, Nelly Quinn. So, yeah, so I had a night out in oh. Ireland with Quinny last year, actually. <laughs> we went to the races and stuff, and I was telling him he was just pissing himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I came through with him. What, so, what like, was it like, though, I, to meet him? I was him? in the youth team when um, when he was in the first All team, right. and then I broke into the first team squad. So I was, like, training with him every day, travelling to work games, blah, blah, blah. So I've known him since I was, like, 16-year-old. Yeah. But you know what it's like, you go on your different paths and I've not seen him for years. And then I was over in Ireland, like I say, at the races and I had a good drink with him all day and, well, all night as well. And uh, no, it was, it was good crap. Fantastic. So what about after football? And um, what, what did you... I never really wanted to go into coaching. I'm not saying I never will, but it wasn't really for me. And um, I knew I was going to pack in. And an opportunity came up to go into car sales. So it's nothing that I've ever really thought of before, but it's one of them. You pack in and you think, right, what do I need, What can I do now? It's not like when you play in the Premier League and you've got millions in the bank and you don't need to worry about a job. It was, right, I need to, I need to do something. I've got kids to provide for and what have you. And yeah, I went into cars. Um, I'm still doing it now um, so yeah that was one of it and uh, supplement uh, business as well I'm still, still massively into my health and fitness so that's another little thing that I've got going as well so yeah that's that's the two main things Is it right that you, no, um, you also had a little stint at like, Whitby Town? If you go on Wikipedia, so many people's told me about this. Apparently, I've played like 28 games for Whitby. Right. But my mate, Lee Bullock, I played at Bradford with him. Yeah. And he was Whitby assistant manager. And he was like asking me when I retired, come and train with us. Come and sign for us. So I wanted to keep fit and what have you. And I said, right, I'll come and train with you. So I went training a few times. And then um, I had like a big injury crisis or something. And he was like, Ramos, will you, will you come and be on the bench for us? Like, you're not going to get on, but I'm just... Or you might get on, but do you know what I mean? Will you come and sign for us? So I signed. When, I can't even remember where we played. Somewhere random away. I was on the bench. Obviously, was never going to get on. And then I never went back again after that, I don't think. But for some reason, it's down that I've played like 28 games for Whitby. But no, it never, it never really materialised. I just wasn't fit enough. My heart wasn't in it. Was getting like little niggles even when I was going training with them and stuff, and it just no, nothing really come of that massively. Yeah, right, someone's been editing it, I'm guessing. Yeah, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> About a week after I signed for games, when did you know it was time to retire? Unfortunately, so it wasn't, it wasn't through lack of um fitness or ability or anything like that, but. I'd left Motherwell and I had a few clubs wanting to sign me, like not sign me, wanted a few a few clubs wanted me to go and train with them pre season, like Blackpool and Carlisle and a few others. And Gates had uh, said, Oh, come in and train with us. And it was the old Sunderland manager when I was a kid, Malcolm Crosby. So I thought, Oh, great. That's a good start. And um, it meant that I could move back home to Sunderland. Mm. So I went and trained with them. Lads were spot on. Uh, they offered me a contract and I weighed up I've got three kids do I take a contract or do I take a risk and go and train with your Blackpools or Carlisles or whatever and um, yeah I just I thought for the family and what have you we can move home and I signed for Gateshead so like I say about a week or two later and you're playing in front of like three or four hundred people and Pretty much every away game in that league's about six hours away because Gateshead's miles from everywhere in that division. Um, I just thought, do you know what? This isn't for me anymore. I'd gone from playing in front of big crowds in Scotland and big games and stuff, and it was as if like my heart wasn't in it anymore. So that's when I started thinking about retiring.
what 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 was it like when you're having to move? So when you transfer to a club and you know you knowing that you've got to move close. Do you know what? Like to live. What what's it like in that? Yeah, aspect? did you? Yeah, I've did you move from to, to, from you know Nottingham it when you moved to me play today, for County? Yeah. Said, I've got a new job opportunity and you've got to move for, I don't know, Scotland or wherever. Wouldn't bother me. Like the moving side of things has always excited me a little bit, actually. It's like, right, let's go and see what this club's like or this area or what have you. Um, but the Gateshead move was purely more like the kids were at an age, right, we need to get them into a school, move home, see my family. And it was it was more, the other career moves were purely football and reasons. It was like, right, such and such want to sign me. Yeah, great club. Let's go there. Whereas with Gateshead, it was more. It just, it just seemed to fit for like the family scenario, if you know what I mean. And it just obviously just didn't pan out right. Mm-hmm. It's one of them where you're from, isn't it? Like, like I, I used to, I used bit. to just miss the crack with my mates yeah. and going to the matches and things like yeah. that more than anything or seeing the family and things. But a lot of the time they would come up to matches even when I played in Scotland or my dad would go to all my games. So, um, nah, I, ne- I never really had an issue with that. At the end of the day, if I finished a match on a Saturday and I wanted to go home, I'd just drive home. It, was, it wasn't an issue. Fair play. <laughs> In in terms of mo- moving then as well, what w- was you always like? If so, so when you played um, for Motherwell, was you always living in? Motherwell yeah, when I when I signed for Motherwell, like, it's like in, just in uh, the area. I was in a hotel for about four or five weeks. We just had a newborn, so we had the, the baby in the hotel with us. Um, and it was a case of right, we could do with really finding somewhere to live now, and uh, we moved to Hamilton. But Hamilton's practically joined onto Motherwell. It's like it's like a mile apart from each other. So, yeah, going to training on a morning and what have you, it was like a five minute drive. It was nothing, five ten minutes. Whereas when I signed for uh, Bradford, I was driving from the northeast to Bradford every day. You're talking like an hour and a half um, before training and back, and that that sort of took its toll after a while. I think a few of my injuries and stuff, but possibly came from that. Um, and I started staying over in a hotel and things like that, which wasn't ideal um, when you look back now. But no, like I say, apart from that, it didn't bother me moving about. Yeah, I wasn't really. It, did you get, it's still did, a bugbear now. It's like, I was always one of the fittest in the team. So if you ask any player that played with me, they would say, oh, Ramos was at the front of the running or Ramos whatever, like, give 100%. But yet, I always used to pick up, like, niggles or... Like, I had a couple of bad injuries, actually, like a couple of hip operations and knees and things like that. But I don't know, I used to look at players who maybe weren't given 100% or wouldn't go into a tackle, and they're never injured. And you think, like, where's the... F- like, this, it's just not fair. Like, you give 100% and you fly into a tackle, and obviously it, it backfires at times because then you're out for a for a spell, so... Yeah, unfortunately, I did have a lot of injury issues through my career. I think, yeah, I think a lot of other players that's, are scared that's it, of boys. It's just me. Like, I wouldn't change really. it. I would never duck out of a challenge, or um, I'd maybe maybe wouldn't have gone out as much. I suppose in my career, maybe that had a little effect on it. But um, no, as in when I trained or when I played, I always give a hundred percent. So injuries are part part of the game, unfortunately. Yeah, no. Sadly for some players, it's the end of their game. It's ruthless at times, isn't it? Football. So, you know that when you get into it, um, when you cross that white line, you've got to give 100%. And if you get injured, you get injured. It's part and parcel. Mm -hmm. You just got to look at Dean Ashton with. He went to block block a a challenge. Yeah, I mean, luckily, them stories are few and far between. Um, I think there was a lad at Peterborough last week who was that retired young lad with a head injury. Um, There's not that many of them where it's a freak incident like that. But on the whole, very, very rare if you go through your career without 
a couple of operations or a big spell on the sidelines at some point. I don't care who you are. Generally, you're going to have a spell out and you just got to deal with it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Is, is um, you no, the, the club, the club pay for that. So I remember person. when I was at uh, Gateshead, I had a hernia operation. I think they, it's different at that level. They they got some help from the PFA to pay towards it. Um, but when I was at like Bradford or Motherwell and what have you, and I had operations, that the club sort that out. Or whether they do it through their insurance, I don't know the ins and outs, but they they definitely pay. Right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll finish with one last question. We, we ask this to everyone, so we'll give, you a, we'll give you a bit of time to think about it because we've not really prepared you for it. Um, football in three, three words. words, what would it be? How, how would you sum up um, in three words? Yeah, you should have prepared us for this, mate. <laughs> <laughs> three words. <laughs> <laughs> We we can give you yeah, a, go on, then. A, we can give you what some of them said before if you like. So, what we've had before is we've had mm-hmm. people, tea, and floodies. So it's about the people, the tea, and the floodlight. Mm-hmm. Um, bit by the bug, but we we take the dirt out because we're from Yorkshire. We've had um, look, the beautiful game, and then we've had so it can be just three words. Or it, or it can just be a generic word. So, like, someone said people because it's all about the people. T because it, when he goes to non-league, it, it loves Yeah, I would, I would probably say... It loves a good floodlight. So, it could be anything. Passion, which is what I was always give, and the fans I would relate to with a passion. Commitment, um, like we spoke about throughout this podcast. Any, anybody who played with me would always say that I give 100%. So... I would say passion, commitment, and enjoyment. Enjoyment. You look back now, some of the memories, and like you say, we talked about the Champions League and Wembley and things like that. It's it's enjoyable times that you're never going to get back. So, for me, I'll, I'll go for them three. Yeah, that'll That's do fantastic. me, mate. Couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> yep. Spot on, mate. Right, Simon. No problem at all, lads. Anytime. Anytime. Pleasure. And once again, thank you for coming on. It's been great to see you. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much for your time.